Hey everyone, my name is Sam Corris and I direct our autonomous tech and robotics research here at ARC. Uh, we're doing a review of our big ideas and we're going to dive in and uh, see what I had to say about robotics and see what's changed so far this year. Right now we're going to dive into the robotics section of big ideas uh, with the tagline decoupling physical labor from output. I really think this is the best way to understand automation and robotics from a high level uh, throughout history, really. It's how do we separate the effort that we put in as humans uh, from what we get out of it, right? The tractor, a classic example there. Without it, far more people would be working in agriculture than they currently do. And I think an important framing here is to understand that with automation, it transforms and creates industries that we would not necessarily predict ahead of time. So you have a classic example. We've Most people have, have access to this is a washing machine. And so before washing machines, it would take roughly 15 hours to do laundry. Uh, and this is not to say that people spent two thirds of their day doing laundry, um, but rather, you know, you wash your clothes uh, every couple of months, every few months. And as you start to automate this and you bring it down and you have people spending, you know, two hours uh, a week doing laundry, you create industries that you wouldn't have otherwise expected, right? You, you, the fashion industry uh, is somewhat based on the fact that you can wash clothes quickly. Uh, you've got the washing machine service and sales and the, the more directly tied ones there. Uh, you can think of you know, auto manufacturing as well, pre and post assembly line, right? People were selling cars before the assembly line and this re massive reduction in input to output via the assembly line created a massive industry uh, that still exists today. So, you know, I think that's good to have in the back of the mind as well. Uh, when we're looking at opportunities today with robotics, what makes this so exciting? Uh, I think uh, I just stopped there. I think this, you know, whole capital versus labor and automation versus labor, it's certainly extremely relevant today. The most I've seen it talked about is uh, because of how much these LLMs, large language models, how much progress these uh, AI capabilities are advancing here. It is interesting. I think if you ask people five years ago, um, obviously, you know, this was probably just the start as of the new AI boom, uh, but people always expected, you know, blue collar jobs are gonna be the first to get taken. And that's actually not been the case because of uh, where robotics has been. Uh, but really, you know, AIs came in on the, on the knowledge worker side and are disrupting more there. Uh, I think we will see that trickle into the real world uh, and real world embodied AI is a huge topic that's really uh, emerged this year. And, and that's really where you start getting into, you know, less of the knowledge worker disruption and more into the physical world. But I think I, think I do talk about it at, in this, but uh, we don't think that leads to technological unemployment. And uh, let's see if I, I hit on that. If we went back five years, a lot of people would say that there were serious um, hardware limitations for robotics. And, uh, you know, we hear some of that today, uh, but really robots are converging with artificial intelligence, AI, uh, various models, computer vision, and the limit on robotics now seems to be software gated. And that's super exciting because of how quickly software is moving. And so, what we're seeing right now is this idea of humanoid robots or generalizable robotics. And we think that this could be a $26 trillion global revenue opportunity um, in, in the long run here. And we think that's roughly split equally between household robotics and manufacturing. I think an important thing to understand here though is that uh, the introduction of these is not going to be all at once, right? If you introduce a robot that is just as capable as a human, then it almost doesn't matter what that robot costs, right? If you look at the hourly wage plus benefits of a worker in the U.S. over 10 years, that's roughly 500, the net present value of that is roughly $550,000. Uh, so you could imagine that 
a robot that is as good as a human uh, could be worth like worthwhile paying five hundred fifty thousand dollars for it. Uh, I think the reality, though, is we're going to see this gradual curve of performance. And so it's saying, you know, if a robot can boost productivity by 2%, 5%, 10%, you know, what is it worth paying for? And I think a unique thing here with a robot versus a autonomous vehicle is that a robot can do a task, n not necessarily a full job. So an autonomous vehicle really needs to do the full job. I think that point's relevant. Th this year, there's been a lot of discussion. You know, different humanoid robot companies are going after different markets, whether that is at home or in a factory. And it is, you know, on this task front, and are people willing to accept less than perfection? I think the Roomba is a great example, right? It, it did a single thing, and for a long time, it did not do it very well, and it still sold uh, a ton, right? And they, you know, I was always surprised by that. I don't think they were that useful until very recently. Um, but people accepted it because it was novel. It was somewhat time-saving, uh, even though it wasn't perfect. And I think, you know, people are pretty accepting of that to a surprising degree. You can't say, you know, this car can do the one task of turning right, and that's great. And that's a huge benefit, right? It's like the unlock for autonomous vehicles is it being able to do the full job, not just lane keep on a highway, not just turn right or make blind lefts. You want it to take you from point A to point B. With robotics, especially in manufacturing, you can isolate a single task and there can be a huge opportunity there. Um, and then, you know, lastly here, I'll say there's a constant fear of robots taking humans' jobs. Uh, the reality, at least historically, has been that it's actually created enormous opportunities and taken non-market activity and turned it into revenue generating activity and GDP. And so, you know, mentioned the tractor at the beginning, I'll, I'll come back to it now. Of the 82% of people who, quote, lost their jobs between 1950 and 2000, uh, almost all of those farm workers were unpaid family members who were then freed up to join the labor force and contribute in a different way. And so, you know, there will certainly be displacement, uh, but I believe that, you know, we're not talking about total destruction of jobs here. All right, there you have it. I do think that last point uh, is true. I think people often talk about, you know, what the end state is. And I think Frank Frank's mentioned it with AI broadly. It's right the work week in terms of hours worked has historically gone down. Uh, that could very well continue to be the case. There is, you know, at the very end state, hopefully a world of sustainable abundance, as you know, you get cheap energy and automation making a whole host of new things possible. Uh, but maybe we look at what's happened this year, some interesting things on the generalizable robotics, robotics side. I'd say one of the biggest things, uh, speed of China. I, I mentioned this in the uh, reusable rockets one as well, right? China is on the move um, in terms of, you know, AI, rockets, robots, uh, you know, some impressive demos. I think what we've been hearing is in true China form, they've been incredibly fast and good on the hardware side a little bit slower on the software side. Uh, some innovative thinking as well. You know, people often talk about whether or not a robot needs to recharge. Uh, there is a demo in China of a robot that has two batteries, and so it can automatically swap one of the batteries while the other one is keeping it powered, and so it could function theoretically close to 24 hours a day. Um, and then there's just been advancement amongst the uh, leading players. So you have Tesla, who's talked about, uh, they were trying to make roughly 10,000 uh, generalizable Optimus robots this year. That got pushed slightly as they um, decided to go for a third version, which they think is the version that makes sense to scale on. So that's V3 of Optimus. You had Figure AI, they released you know, Helix, um, and they showed their robot, you know, continuous video of, I think it was an hour long of it sorting packages. Uh, they just showed a demo video of it, um, an impressive video of it 
walking, they, they claimed, without using uh, vision, I believe, and it folding some towels. Um, I've seen, you know, other videos of, of robots in, in different founders' homes, you know, helping with laundry. And so all of this is continuing the pace of advancement in AI uh, being translated into the real world. I do think embodied AI is still something that is uh, elusive to some extent, right? You have it with Tesla and uh, the autonomous vehicles. I think the data collection side here, there's a lot to be done in terms of training, uh, but we're certainly seeing the advancements continue along the way. And I think the long-term trends that we discussed at the beginning of the year are very much still in place. Um, trying to think, is there anything that I would want to see by the end of the year? Um, I do think, yeah, some more real-world deployments are going to be uh, very important just on that data collection side and, and people really understanding what the capability is here. I think there's been tons of excitement over humanoid robots. Um, and I think that is probably going to continue as people, you know, really start to see what they're capable of. And we'll give another update in Big Ideas 2026 and look forward. Maybe, maybe 2027 we'll have a humanoid robot doing this and I'll just be talking through it.